Thank you, uh, and welcome again uh, for uh, Crow 2023. Uh, so today we are uh, highlighting uh, a collaborative project between KAUST, uh, King Saud University, and uh, King Fahd University of Petrol Mir, uh, under the uh, framework of uh, a grant sponsored by CST. So CST is uh, the Commission of uh, Space and Technology. They changed their name recently. They used to be called CITC. Uh, it's, for those of you familiar with the uh, uh, U.S. agencies, is similar to the FCC in the U.S. So in, in particular, they are in charge of spectrum regulation uh, in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, I think all of us uh, uh, now enjoy mobile communication as part of our daily life. Uh, if you are familiar with this uh, industry, or I would say even this uh, business, uh, you know that this industry works on a 10-year cycle. So it takes about 10 years to develop a generation of wireless communication system, and another 10 years to basically uh, deploy it and uh, start using it uh, until it matures, and then you move on. So as you know now, uh, we are extensively uh, deploying 5G worldwide, and uh, for us, researcher in wireless communication, it means that we are actively thinking about what beyond 5G, what 6G should be. And one of the issues uh, that we have been focusing on in KAUST uh, has been trying to look at uh, one particular aspect of beyond 5G and 6G, which is about connecting more people. Of course, you, you we need to, to kind of push the envelope and, and keep uh, doing better in terms of speeds, in terms of lowering latencies, increasing the, uh, let's say, the uh, 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 density of connect device within uh, unit uh, uh, areas. But uh, one important topic uh, that uh, uh, we need also to solve is to connect more people. So just let me give you two statistics. About one third of world population is still not connected or underconnected. About two billion people, according to the last ITU statistics. Now, locally, even in Saudi Arabia, my understanding is that about 4,000 locations are still unconnected or underconnected. So there is a need to come up with technologies that are affordable and that can be deployed in order to connect some of these typically remote regions, uh, low income regions, uh, and ha hard to reach regions. Now, those of you who were here yesterday uh, and attended the opening speech of our president, uh, he mentioned that sustainability is in our DNA from day one. Before actually the United Nations adopted a few years ago these uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, part of sustainability is to make sure that, uh, you know, as you know, these SDGs are, are about, uh, you, know, uh, come, you know, kind of uh, achieving these noble goals and in particular reduce inequalities and give opportunities for everyone. So in our context, bringing uh, uh, digital connectivity for everyone, uh, making sure that everyone can take advantage of the benefit that comes with an internet is a major objective. And as such, many of us, uh, in this community of researchers in beyond 5G and 6G believe that in contrast to the earlier generation of wireless communication system, which were essentially driven by profit and financial perspective, should also focus on trying to fulfill the United Nations SDGs. In other words, our hope, our goal, is that this United Nations SDGs will drive, at least in part, the evolution of 6G, which means we want these 6G systems to be more energy efficient, more green. We want them to, of course, uh, not affect the environment and human health. We want to be more secure and more private because we rely on them on our daily life more and more. Of course, because of that also, we want them to be very dependable and very robust. And we want this aspect that I had earlier, we want to provide digital inclusiveness. We want to connect all the remaining unconnected and underconnected people worldwide. Now, one very important aspect that people maybe not uh, not expert let's say are not familiar with that one of the cost and one of the challenges associated with deploying wireless communication system is the spectrum the spectrum is a natural resource it's like a piece of land you cannot create spectrum the spectrum is finite it's getting congested why because spectrum uh, you know has to kind of uh, respond to the needs of many competing uh, industries and businesses of course, classical, traditional radio TV broadcastings 
uh, have to occupy part of the spectrum. Government, defense, public safety have to rely on part of the spectrum. And over the last three, four decades, all this great evolution in wireless and mobile communication is basically eating a lot of the what we call a radio frequency spectrum that has been, uh, you know, basically fully uh, occupied now by uh, these many applications. So one of the problem is that we are running out of spectrum. So people are talking about spectrum, uh, uh, you know, congestion, and some people are even worried to have a spectrum deficit that we are running out of spectrum if we want to keep deploying uh, wireless generation of system as we have been deploying them. Now. How can we solve this problem? This is uh, the only equation I will show today. So one metric as well as telecom engineer that we are often after is what we call the area traffic capacity. That's the bit per second per unit area. And you can take that very simple uh, kind of uh, uh, target and split it into three factors, bit per second per hertz per node, which is the number of basically or the amount of information you are able to squeeze in with this pipeline uh, that connects uh, essentially your device to the closed access point. Network density, which is how many nodes you are able to deploy within a certain unit area. And of course, spectrum. So in other words, if you live in this world with this kind of area traffic capacity and you want to grow in terms of air traffic capacity and cover more users, you need to increase in either one of these dimensions or in combined kind of uh, these dimension uh, uh, improvement in order to uh, go to the next target. And that's actually one of the main uh, uh, essentially uh, objective of our project. So our project and uh, Professor Ali uh, and Professor Salah uh, will be uh, summarizing some of the uh, uh, results that we have uh, uh, established as part of this research study is to focus actually on a relatively low part of the spectrum. It's uh, the UHF uh, uh, band, which is the sub 700 megahertz. It's just actually 200 megahertz of band that has been traditionally used worldwide for TV broadcasting. As you know, the TV industry has evolved. There's less and less need for TV broadcasting, but you know, traditionally, the way it has been done, that vast band has been allocated, not only in Saudi Arabia, but worldwide. And the question is, how can we take advantage of that band now that that TV broadcasting technology has evolved. So some countries have chosen to just license that band and make more money. By licensing, meaning by that, they give that to operators, and that's, in our jargon, we call that prime front beach type of spectrum. Why it's front beach? From a real estate analogy, because it's kind of a spectrum that gives you long range and that can go through non-line of sight scenarios. So even if you have blockage, if you have buildings, you may have hills on the way, you can still have quite a bit of extended coverage. So some countries have chosen to license that spectrum and make more money out of it through basically license to mobile network operator. Some other countries have chosen to do a mix solution, which is part of that spectrum is licensed. The other part is unlicensed in order to deploy some basically license-free technology like TV white space uh, and Paul and Riyadh from um, uh, US will give us their experience there, how TV white space have been adopted and have enabled to connect many of the unconnected for, and, when, and here when we talk about unconnected, we are talking about unconnected people and unconnected devices. Unconnected people so that uh, people are uh, unconnected in rural areas or unconnected devices uh, in, in order to enable a variety of IoT type of application in the context of uh, uh, smart agriculture, for example. So. The objective of the study that was basically mandated by the uh, CST was to do this study in, the U uh, in Saudi Arabia, because in Saudi Arabia this band is still available for, uh, 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 for the TV broadcasting, and the plan is how can we use it in an efficient way. And to do that, you need to do a study to analyze what is the impact of sharing the spectrum or allocating the spectrum to mobile communication. In other words, can we allow mobile communication and TV broadcasting to coexist. And with that, you need to study the effect on, or the interference effect, not only within Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia, you can create your own policy, but for a country big like Saudi Arabia, you need to look at the interference that you may cause for all neighboring countries. So 
As you will see from the presentation of Professor Salah and Professor Ali, the main focus was to try to analyze what is the potential interference that can be created to all the neighboring countries if this strategy is adopted solely in Saudi Arabia. Now, with that, so uh, uh, let me introduce our panel. So we have engineer Saad bin Asker from CST, who will introduce CST to those of you who are not familiar with CST, its role in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the Technical Advisory Board uh, that basically put us together, and that's how we collaborated. They, they, they had this very nice initiative where essentially a couple of years ago they appointed a few of us uh, as part of the Technical Advisory Board, and we start interacting on some of these technical problems. Then we have Professor Salah Al-Shibli and Professor Ali Muqaybal, who will be uh, summarizing the study that was done jointly, by again, by KSU, KPM, and KAUST, uh, with the faculty and research from these three universities. And then we have Paul uh, Garnett and Riaz Pishori, who will tell us their experience with TV white space. One of the things that uh, I am you know, uh, advocating for also as part of hopefully the way Saudi Arabia can move, uh, at least myself and maybe a few of my colleagues, in other words, trying to use this 200 megahertz that we have available in Saudi Arabia, in part to, of course, license maybe part of it and, 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 and create some more uh, money and more connectivity uh, over long range distance, but also uh, and license some part of it in order to enable more of the connecting of the unconnected type of technology. So with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Professor Saleh. I think he will start by introducing the problem and, 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 and Professor Ali, right? Or oh, sorry. First of all, I, we need yeah, the Saad. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, Saad, you know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, you, you, let's see if your slide is here. <coughs> yeah, problem. How are you all? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for this uh, introduction. You make my job easy. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I want just to uh, emphasize how this group uh, collaborated and why it's mandated by uh, CST. But first, let's see uh, what CST uh, do in spectrum management in Saudi Arabia. Uh, CST is uh, the ICT regulator, telecom regulator, and also it is the national uh, spectrum manager in the kingdom with the uh, vision of uh, con uh, connecting the nation uh, for a thrifting uh, digital uh, economy and with its mission to uh, promote the uh, latest technology in the kingdom with uh, also affordable uh, prices. But CST has a national spectrum strategy uh, starting from 2020 till 2025 with the vision of unlocking the potential of radio communication in KSA for a smarter and uh, safe uh, future. Our mission has three uh, guiding principles. Uh, the first one is the, uh, we want to be uh, like a future uh, oriented we want to adopt the latest technology in the kingdom. Also, we want this to be in an efficient way. And also, we want to be engaged with all the stakeholders. And this is the idea why we, we are engaging the academia in, uh, in our work. Because the spectrum crunch is, <laughs> is a problem for researchers, but it's, it's an operational problem for us. Our spectrum strategy with the vision has three pillars, three main pillars. These three main pillars have produced a lot of uh, projects and initiatives. One of the pillars is to unlock the future by optimizing the legacy spectrum and fostering the uh, commercial and innovative use of uh, spectrum radios. Also empowering uh, a smart spectrum, adopting adaptive regulatory mechanism and uh, uh, facilitate the wireless access and investment. The last one is the building the foundation for that. And the most important thing is engaging the whole ecosystem together. These are the uh, latest uh, spectrum outlook that CST has issued. It's called the spectrum outlook for uh, commercial and innovative use. And we have issued and released more than 23 gigahertz 
by uh, release it for uh, licensed sp uh, spectrum more than uh, 4 giga and also license exempt applications more than uh, 6.2 gigahertz and for lightly li uh, licensed spectrum more than 13 gigahertz. But uh, how, what is the life cycle of the spectrum? As you know, the spectrum is planned and then acquired, and then it's deployed and utilized. And some technology, they, they are di died, like uh, what we uh, uh, speak about, the, the digital broadcast. It's died eventually. And we uh, have to reform the, the band to get better utilization. And we manage the spectrum vice versa. Like we have the evaluation stage, and then we have the planning, and then the execution by meaning we license the spectrum. Just to give you a small glimpse about the, the structure and how we are work to uh, performing these actions. We have a radio spectrum planning, and also we have radio spectrum surfaces, and also we have a radio spectrum monitoring. We monitor and we uh, measure the utilization of the spectrum in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But we are managing the spectrum on a national level so that we have a national spectrum coordination committee shared by uh, his governor, uh, Mohammed Tamimi. And this committee has also subcommittee to report back to the national committee. One of these committee is the Spectrum Advisor Group, which is contained uh, of a group members of the university and of the uh, academia and experts of the RF industry. Here is uh, the members of the Spectrum Advisor Group shared by Dr. Samuel Hamidi. He is the uh, chairman of Prince Sultan Defense uh, Studies and uh, Research and also uh, our distinguished professors are members of this uh, committee. But what is the role and responsibilities for this committee? This uh, uh, Spectrum Advisor Group is responsible for recognizing the research properties and interest related to the radio spectrum in the, uh, in the kingdom with the goal of uh, enhancing the national uh, capabilities and uh, affecting uh, or, or studying or analyzing the policy uh, impact in the kingdom and also uh, doing a lot of international contribution to the uh, ITU and promoting the local technology. Here is some of uh, the work that have been conducted by the, uh, this uh, advisor group and uh, inshallah Dr. Saleh and Dr. Ali will elaborate more on, uh, on some of the problems. But these are the most, and, uh, the most topics that have been conducted by the advisor group uh, last year. And also we have, they have a lot of work to do because it's not enough for one slide to be honest. But, uh, uh, they will. Uh, they are developing like uh, a, a focusing group, focusing on research and innovation, and on national and international partnership, and awareness the uh, com uh, community participation, and developing and training the capabilities inside the kingdom. Thank you very much. It was a brief <laughs> uh, slide, and this is my uh, contact information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Saad, for this uh, nice and uh, you know, compact uh, overview of uh, CST, its role, uh, the role of the, advisory, the Spectrum Advisory Board. And uh, uh, now I would like uh, to uh, you know, invite to the uh, stage Professor Saleh, who will give us, uh, uh, along with Professor Ali, uh, a brief presentation or summary of the result of a study done uh, uh, in collaboration between uh, uh, KSU, KFM, and KAUST. Professor Saleh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad. And also, I would like to thank uh, KAUST for inviting me for this uh, uh, workshop. 
the study that has been mandated for KSU and KAUST and uh, also KFU BM is the sharing and compatibility studies in the subband, the so 700 megahertz UHF band. When we say 700 megahertz, we mean the 600 megahertz bands. And uh, the basic idea is to study the interference and the coexistence of the two systems. From one side is the International Mobile Telecommunication System, the I IMT. And on the other side is the Digital Terrestrial Television Broadcasting. And we would like to see whether these two systems can coexist and can co uh, work together without interfering each other. You know the interference is a very distracting thing as it is a real case and I can read examples like what I am having now. I'm very sorry that my transmission is a little bit bad. This is some sort of a noise, so even the reception will be difficult for you, and even my reception for some of the, your voices will affect this type of distortion also affecting the hearing system. So it is very important that two systems to, to coexist without interference. Uh, in fact, the, the study consists of two phases. The f one phase is to study the interference in one system than the other, the second phase will be the effect of the other system than the first one. So these types of phases, uh, we have some initial results that we're going to present. Fortunately, I have my colleagues, Dr. Ali, with me. So I will take the easiest part, which is just introduction, and I will give him the tough part, which is the results and the question and answers. So please take care <laughs> and ask him whatever you wish uh, uh, about this one. So let me give you an idea. I would like, at least from my presentation, to take some yani, takeaways, concepts, and some useful information before we give you some of the initial results that we have obtained. Of course, final results will be the CST, as uh, Dr. Mohammed mentioned, which is uh, funding this type of a study. Uh, as mentioned, uh, in fact, the, the work is supervised and uh, supported by the CST, and three universities are working, King Abdullah and King Saud and King Fahad universities. Both, uh, all these type of universities are representative in, uh, represented in the, uh, the Spectrum Advisory Group, and at the very beginning, uh, when the, the, the group has been formed, it was the only three universities at that time, then CST uh, desired that uh, these type all three universities to work on the same problem. And we thank CST for this initiative because also they strengthen the collaboration between the three universities. But when at a later stage, this, this board has been expanded and more university has been involved uh, in different studies uh, required by CST. Uh, let, me, let me give you some idea about what is exactly the problem. Uh, as uh, we mentioned that the study is for the coexisting of the IMT system which is close to the border of Saudi Arabia. And you, when you, are, you would like to deploy the system uh, uh, over all the country, you have an another problem that your neighboring country, they still have utilizing the TV. So you, will ha you might have a problem at the border where look at the picture in front of you. Uh, the digit, the, the, the on the right hand side, you will see the neighboring country where the TV broadcasting exists and also the receiver of the TV broadcasting. From the left-hand side, it is the IMT system, where is the side of Saudi Arabia. If I'm going to deploy the IMT system at the left-hand side, and the TV broadcasting at the right-hand side, close to the border, these two systems might interfere. And the study now is to, to see at what conditions and the operating parameters that you need to design your IMT system so that you maintain and these two systems can uh, coexist and work without any interfering each other. So now, if you look at the, the, the picture once again, the two phases of the study, and of course the band what we are considering is from the 614 up to 694 megahertz, which is utilized by the TV uh, transmission. The first phase, which is phase one, uh, we are studying the effect of the IMT system base station on the TV receiver, plus the uh, effect of the IMT user equipment, the mobile that user is carrying, on the also the receiver of the TV. 
So there are two types of interferences that are uh, affecting the uh, TV receiver. It is the transmission from the base station and to the transmission from the user, expert, uh, user equipment. The other type of interference, which is the study of the phase two, which is also a difficult one, which is the effect of the TV on the IMT system. And there are also two types of interferences that we are receiving. The effect from the TV broadcasting on the IMT base station and the effect of the TV bro broadcasting on the mobile user. And here we need to consider two things, the downlink and also the uplink. What are the effect on the downlink from the base station to the user equipment and the uplink from the user equipment to the base station. So it is four types of interferences that we need to uh, study. And Dr. Ali, inshallah, he will present some of the initial results. But of course, the final results will be reported to the uh, CST and will be released later on after the, all the simulations and all studies are complete, it takes it uh, final form. Uh, in order to the, do interference analysis, it is good for the audience to understand or at least know about the tools that can be used in that regard. There are two types of uh, interference analysis tools. One of them is the empirical models and simple equations with some measured curves and well-known measurements that has been uh, performed by researchers reporting to IT and so on. And these type of empirical models, even we find it all in most of the time in the textbook, is well suited for generic studies where you would like to study the effect and you assume certain uh, environment like urban or rural uh, type of studies. And these type of studies can be easily done using the SIMCAT, which is one of the uh, uh, softwares that are available in the internet and can be downloaded, it is a free. And also the ITU uh, community, they are utilizing it for some of the generic uh, studies. The other ones, which is a little bit commercial and a little bit costly, is the comprehensive, uh, comprehensive models. And these type co uh, context and terrain aware. So you can utilize the GIS data, uh, data uh, information so that you can upload the ITU, uh, from the ITU databases, the location of the base stations, you take the terrain into, uh, into account. And this, yeah, you can consider more uh, information about the, 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 the locations and the state of your scenarios. And these sophisticated softwares, I will give you some examples of which is the HTZ and Wireless Insight and also Progeria. Those type of uh, softwares takes the terrain and the clutter into consideration to give you more, more accurate results. For example, the HTZ communication by ATDI company, uh, it features a lot of empirical and deterministic and hybrid propagation models, more than 50 of these. It also provides network coverage and calculations featuring a lot of uh, uh, features like high resolution can go up to one meter by one meter. And this depends on the maps that will be uploaded in, 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 the, in the software. For example, in Saudi Arabia, the available uh, maps that we have is around 20 by 20 meters. But even you can go, uh, go to a larger uh, dimensions, uh, it depends on the study. If you are studying a large area, you cannot go to one meter by one meter resolution. It to be a higher sonar that you accommodate a lot of uh, information. Also, it supports uh, 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 other uh, technologies like broadcast, radio cellular, and other issues. This is one of the, their pictures where the, we can see network coverage in this urban area. Uh, and this is what type of outputs that you can obtained from such a software. So we utilize this software in our analysis, uh, which is, uh, to be honest with you, very important that we give a good uh, and reliable results for the CST in terms of the interferences that can be obtained from those uh, uh, studies. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Ali, inshallah, he will complete the presentations and he will give you uh, some results about the two phases. Phase one is, as I mentioned, the effect of the IMT in the, uh, on the TV receiver, and the other side is the TV receive a t transmission on the IMT. 
and he will give some uh, results for the urban rural or, and urban urban and rural rural results as i mentioned this is an initial results but at least you can go out of this meetings and with some benefits and you have good uh, interpretation and information about the type of the study and the results that can be obtained thank you very much uh, I hope that you get some introductory material. And as I mentioned, the tough part is with my colleague, Dr. Ali. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good morning. I'll start by thanking uh, uh, KAUST and the CST, KAUST and Professor Mohammed for inviting us for this presentation. Uh, I'm standing here not because I'm expert. I'm standing to represent uh, one third of the group. Uh, but luckily, we have uh, people who really did the hard work, uh, Dr. Ammar, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Amr around. So if you have any questions, then uh, we'll get back to them. Well, I, I accepted to take the difficult part, uh, Dr. Saleh, out of respect not to speak before Dr. Saleh. Professor Saleh is a well-known figure in communication in the kingdom. So it's okay to take the difficult part uh, and not to speak before him. <laughs> so thank you. So uh, just back to the results. Um, I'll start looking at some sample results. So we, we took UAE case A as an urban rural example, then Bahrain case A, and then case A Egypt. Egypt. Th those borders are a little bit different. We have more than that, but I'm just sharing some of the results. So starting with UAE case A, you can see here um, in, in the boundary between UAE, uh, the, the sort of dotted line is, is a border line between United Arab Emirates and the Saudi Arabia. And this is special because the side of United Arab Emirates, th there isn't much people living there. So it's almost empty uh, from that side of the border. So looking at uh, some of the system parameters and variables. When we say variables, we mean the things that change. F so we look at the operating frequency for this study. We have 662, 66. So these things, uh, the first line shows the operating frequency, second line of the height of the transmitting antenna. The third line is for the transmitted power in DBM, and then the location of the TV towers. This is imported from the database, the IT database. So the simulation should match the true uh, scenario. In addition to the variables, we have also some parameters that are fixed, including the antenna radiation pattern, channel bandwidth, height, and the antenna radiation pattern, gain, and so on. So those are the parameters that we use for the simulation. For the case of the IMT, the previous numbers were for the TV broadcasting uh, stations. And now for the case of the mobile stations, we have uh, on the green side, we have the parameters. On the right hand, we have some variables to be changed, including the frequencies. So this also includes the, the antenna parameters, uh, bandwidth, gain, and so on. Those are fed into uh, the simulation software, including 87 uh, base stations. And uh, with, with their details, then the simulation is run. So uh, when it comes to the transmitting base stations, I give the database, uh, I give the data for the TV broadcasting stations, for the mobile stations. And now we have what is in between, which is a propagation channel. The propagation model used is given temperature and details with air pressure. Uh, you know what makes this study is very special is that uh, the propagation characteristics in the kingdom and the communication environment is really different, including uh, the widespread of desert, the humidity, the temperature, all these affects the communication. So uh, the first slide with the results, you can see here that um, uh, those towers, uh, I, I hope that you can see them, represent the, the, tele the TV broadcasting stations. And then this, the circles around them re representing the coverage area. And also then we have the solid uh, blue line. This represents the coverage area expected with uh, given parameters of 21 dB. So this is the expected cover coverage region. And you can see that most of the region is inside the United Arab Emirates. So clearly, we are not causing problems. And most of the covered area is uh, almost green or, or yellow. So there is no real big interference. So that says, if you want to operate, if you want to use this band at initial results at the kingdom for, uh, for mobile communication, then you are not causing trouble to your neighbor. Uh, just to add to that, the, the, the minimum distance between the base station in United Arab Emirates and, and the first uh, closest mobile station is about 100 kilometers, which, which leaves a coordinating distance of more than 50 kilometers. Now, going to Bahrain as another ex example, 
Saudi Arabia, Bahrain borders. You can see the border line. And then I'm going sh to share with you uh, the parameters for the base stations. Again, this is true parameters, which are imported from ITU database, including the locations, transmit power, and frequencies. Now, running the simulation, you can see that uh, there is uh, the sea, the gulf in between. So there is no usage of telephone lines in between. And you can see that uh, due to the use of directional antenna. So Bahrain, they have their own coverage for TV. And but the use of, they're very close. From my office, I can see Bahrain. I can see the, at least the causeway uh, from the office. So they're really close. But um, uh, luckily, in between, we have the sea. And they, they're using directional antenna. So when we run the simulation, still uh, there is a promising result, uh, although initial result, that the covered area, this side of Bahrain, is not being affected. Most of this red area is uh, in the seaside. Moving to the third uh, example, which is case A and Egypt. OK, so again, running this, we are getting a similar result. Uh, we got the parameters, and then we look at uh, uh, the base stations, and we looked at uh, what the coverage area. And we can see that most of the covered area, uh, which is inside the blue lines, is again uh, not affected by uh, that communication. We have on the left-hand side, we have the co-channel interference, and we have uh, uh, the, the adjacent channel interference. Now, to sum up the conclusions, the effect of UE uh, user equipment is negligible on the, on the TV broadcasting surfaces when transmitting at maximum power. So we expect when you have less power to have even easier scenario. The downlink is considered an adjacent interference, so we don't have a big problem. Uh, it has a minimum uh, effect. So to sum up, we have both IMT and, and uh, digital broadcasting TVs will uh, or terrestrial transmission broadcasting will have uh, can coexist together. And uh, I don't know if you mentioned this before or not. Uh, why would somebody go to 700 or sub sub megahertz? What is what is the motivation to use this for mobile? Uh, during the COVID, uh, there were it turns out that lots of people need to to learn to get educated using wireless communication or using at least uh, uh, internet connection. Now there are very small, lots of small towns with 100 maybe uh, people living there and with some kids. So you cannot use the normal bands where we have a base station and the transmission would be very limited. I, I'm sure you know that as you go down on the frequency, the, co the coverage will be higher. So there is a real need for going into this study. Now uh, moving to the second part of the scenario, the border that we studied for phase two. Now uh, we want to make sure that we are not affected uh, in the kingdom. CST would like to know that if we run, we are not aff affecting our neighbors, but are, 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 are we affected by them? So we can see now that, mashallah, to due to the wide area of, of the kingdom, we have lots of uh, borders with many countries. So the study is, exhaust, uh, is exhaustive. Uh, we have 10 different borders were selected. If you want to simulate uh, the entire kingdom with high resolution, it would be uh, formidable. So 10 borders, which are shown in with marks here, uh, were selected. And I'm sharing some of the results, including Iraq case A and Bahrain case A borders again. So uh, now uh, you can see that we are focusing more on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because we're looking at the base stations. Those uh, s this squares and green represent the base stations. And also we have uh, the, the TV broadcasting from Iraq side. Again, you can see that most of the area that we expected to be covered is in green. Small um, areas maybe in uh, in this initial results are in red, but I will show some some mitigation techniques. So uh, I just want to highlight also that uh, the carrier to interference or the carrier to inter interference and noise ratio for this case uh, would like it to be less than 15 dB. Now for the case of uh, the uplink, the previous one for the downlink, we can see that there is more to work to be done because uh, the uplink, the frequency will be similar. So we have uh, more work to be done uh, as initial results. For the case of Bahrain, we have you can see that the entire area for the downlink is again shown as, as a green or yellow. For the case of uplink, because uplink is similar to the, to the frequency of, of the INT. So again, some work is to be done regarding uh, the mitigation techniques, but uh, the results are very promising. So to conclude, the interference from DTTB, digital TV broadcasting, to uh, is higher on the uplink than the, uh, the INT network. The interference increases as we increase the bandwidth, of course. The coexistence of the two networks is possible. It requires implementation of some uh, mitigation techniques. 
And we're suggesting some of them here. Switching off the sectors of INT transmission that is pointing to the TV. We can control which base station, which sector is on to avoid interfe the interference. Down tilting the INT antennas, change the direction of the antenna, optimizing the transmitted power. So to make sure that with less power we can communicate, which results in less interference. Varying IMT antenna height, relocating the frequencies, changing the frequencies to avoid um, uh, interference. And as a final remark, this is just an initial study, and um, I am very thankful to for CST to put uh, the three universities together in KAUST and, and King Saud University and King Fahad to work uh, together. And we're, we're expecting more to come. But uh, for this study, as a final remark, a field measurement campaign is necessary. So what we have shown is some of the initial uh, simulation results. A field measurement already is going on, and we know that CST is taking uh, instrumental measurement in that. They have all the requirements, all the technology and advanced uh, resources that can uh, help in making this uh, a reality. So uh, this is, uh, in a nutshell, what we want to say. So like, again, to, uh, to reiterate that I'm presenting my colleagues, Dr. Ammar, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Saleh. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Saleh and Professor Ali, for this uh, excellent summary for the study that we have been uh, working on over the last year or so. And thanks again to all the team members for their hard work for uh, uh, you know, running this, uh, I would say, tedious and detailed uh, simulation. And uh, I think based on these uh, promising initial results, again, these are just uh, initial results, uh, there is still a long way to go uh, in our uh, study in terms of uh, finalizing the study and uh, submitting the uh, report to CST, but also looking at this mitigating uh, type of approach to uh, basically unlock uh, the, the, this uh, uh, sub 700 megahertz um, uh, part of the spectrum in KSA. Now, the remaining part of the session is what can we do with that? And there are some countries uh, ahead of us who already uh, came up with some policies, uh, and uh, in particular in the USA, uh, they have been uh, uh, using this band for a variety of applications, in particular for what we call, uh, or what is called, TV white space. So uh, we have here two distinguished uh, uh, speakers, uh, uh, Paul and Rial, who will tell us a little bit about uh, the US experience on TV white space, and actually uh, even uh, from other countries that have been using uh, the TV white space technology. Okay, Paul? All right, so we're going to get a little less technical with my presentation. And um, first of all, just uh, I want to thank um, Slim for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's my first time at, at Calst, and I'm, I've been most impressed. I, I was lucky enough last night to have dinner with some students, and and uh, uh, in addition to being a very fun group, um, they they are all quite impressive. So it's it's really great to be here, and this is an, an amazing an amazing place. Um, so first, just a, just a little bit about. Um, me, what I do, uh, my consulting firm, just very briefly. Um, uh, I, I, I've created my consulting firm a couple of years ago, um, really built around the belief that everybody in the world should have access to, to high quality, high speed, affordable um, connectivity. And uh, as, as Slim was mentioning earlier, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. Uh, there, are, there are billions of people around the world um, today who, who are not online. And uh, most of those, most and, and most people who are online around the world are, are primarily on mobile connections. So unlike you and I, who who can use both fixed and mobile connections, they're they're on a, they're s mostly on a mobile connection and, and uh, are somewhat limited in what they can do uh, with their connectivity. Um, so we work with um, uh, various different uh, companies, uh, governments, uh, international organizations, development banks, um, all. Entities that have a vested interest, like we do, in, in helping to solve the, uh, the the global digital divide, and our clients are, are a mix of large and small corporates, so large large uh, companies like Comcast and Amazon, uh, as well as uh, U.S. government. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, development banks, international organizations, and then, and then a lot of smaller companies that are developing new technology, including technology that can be used in in the TV white space frequencies. Uh, as well as other other um, uh, connectivity technology that has has the potential to um, help close the digital divide. Um, so I've been asked to talk about TV white spaces. Uh, I, I I might be the only person on the panel who's not an engineer, so I'm not going to get too technical in this. 
Um, I, I really was uh, o over the last uh, you know couple decades um, in the um, in the position of of helping to commercialize uh, the technologies that have been developed for TV white spaces. Some of the, some of the early pioneering work and helping to to bring it to market and 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 put it into the field and 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 see how it how it works. And um, you know, having done that over the years. Um, uh, you know, one of the sort of things we hear about a lot, and we've heard, we heard about this in some of the presentations earlier this week, there's this real gap between when technology is, is created and, and when you see large market acceptance uh, um, and adoption of, of a technology. And, and oftentimes, to, to, to all of our surprise, um, uh, it takes uh, um, a, a lot more than just a, a, you know, a few years for technology to be invented and make it into the marketplace. It's that closing that gap often is something that takes uh, decades, not years. Um, and there, there are just so many examples of that. I mean, I think, I think of electric cars as being an example th there where, you know, it's, it's been 100 years or more since electric cars were invented, and now they're just starting to, to get um, uh, uh, mass market adoption. And, and um, something like TV white spaces is, is, is really no different. Um, so TV white spaces has been around for a couple of decades. When, when I started working on TV white spaces, I had brown hair, uh, and now, now look at me. Um, so. Uh, so a, a lot of a lot of gray hair on, on my head has been attributed to to, uh, to working on this issue. Um, it has nothing to do with me getting older. It's just you know uh, working on the stuff. So um, so this goes back to sort of around 2000 when this all started, and and um, you know early research, uh, you know uh, IEEE papers written on on this idea of leveraging the unused frequencies in a globally harmonized. Uh, spectrum band, the, the, the TV bands um, around the world. And, um, and then, you know, over time, uh, that, that, that early research got, caught the attention of some spectrum regulators, in particular in the U.S. Um, so we had, you know, the first attention from regulators, and, and uh, they began developing regulations. Um, you know, the first, the first uh, uh, products, uh, you know, radios and uh, databases were were developed and you know prototyped and, and then and put into f into field trials. The first regulators actually adopted um, regulations allowing access to the TV white spaces. Um, uh, we took those prototypes, put them into the field, did the first trials. You know some of the work that um, that the the Sa Saudi government is doing uh, right now. That the same similar types of testing on on coexistence. Um, then we did bigger trials. Then we did then we went from technical trials to commercial pilots and started to really. Um, uh, uh, try out the technology in, in real application, um, yeah, and fast forward to today, um, where there are about um, 20 countries, uh, regulators who, who have, have put in place various different types of regulatory regimes that allow access um, to, uh, to the TV white spaces or the uh, unused, unassigned and unused um, uh, UHF um, uh, frequencies um, for a variety of applications. And the thing that's interesting about this mix of countries, it's, it's not like the usual suspects of like, you know, if you were to sort of pick the first countries in the world to adopt TV white space regulations, this probably wouldn't be your list. Um, uh, you would think more of, um, you know, developed, uh, you know, economies and, uh, and uh, you know, of course, U.S. would be on that list, but, but many other developed economies would be on there. You wouldn't think of places like Kenya or Honduras or, or, or Ghana. Um, and I think the, the thing that um, this group really has in common is um, all of these countries have a digital divide. And, um, and all of them um, are looking for ways to, uh, to alleviate that digital divide, F thinking of different ways, different technologies, different ways of managing their spectrum um, that can help to close that gap between those who have, have connectivity and, and those, those, who, um, those who do not. So that brings me to TV white spaces. And, and um, Slim talked a little bit about um, um, some of the benefits of, of uh, these frequencies. Um, you know, basically the way to think about it is, y is, is you go down and down in the in the frequencies, um, you get better uh, range and propagation from a, from a, from an equivalent radio signal, equivalent power, um, and so with TV white spaces, uh, one of the great benefits of it is, um, is is the signals go over a long distance and they can penetrate a lot of obstacles. So think of like tree foliage, uh, building uh, clutter. Um, even even hills um, uh, can can you can uh, signal can bend over hills, uh, whereas as you go higher up in the frequency band, if you think about um, you know bands that are used today for for example for Wi-Fi, uh, like five gigahertz and now six gigahertz, and folks are even talking about seven gigahertz there, um, th those those frequencies are great for shorter range communications. There's a lot more frequency available in those bands, so you can have higher speeds. Um, but you're not going to be able to penetrate a lot of walls. Like think of your own your own 
you know, Wi-Fi experience in a building. Once you get to that second wall, the signal has a hard time, uh, you know, keeping keeping going. Something like TV white spaces, because it's lower in the frequencies, it can penetrate a lot of obstacles. So it's also something good for in-building coverage. Um, and uh, you know, I've I'm going to focus a little bit more on broadband. Uh, Riaz after me is going to be t talking more about IoT, which is a, you know one of the other applications for TV white spaces. But in the early days, as we were thinking about what are the use cases that would be most interesting for TV white spaces, we sort of settled on two areas. One was broadband connectivity in, in unserved and underserved areas, in, in particular in lower population density rural areas, where you have also have challenges of topography and geography, you know, uh, remote communities. Um, and then the other area was IoT, the sort of emerging area of Internet of Things. Um, and these are the sort of the devices that, that one can use, for example, in agriculture or environmental monitoring and, and uh, you know, security and, and the like. Um, so if I'm a if I'm a so focusing on broadband if I'm a if I'm a broadband provider or I'm a government who wants to uh, ensure that that everyone in my country has access to connectivity I want to have as many tools in the toolkit as possible in order to to achieve that goal. So so if I am building a network and I want to provide ser you know broadband services to customers I'm going to want to you know sort of use the different tools in the toolkit um, based on you know, what I'm trying to achieve. If I'm, if I'm in a rural area, um, I, I'm going to want to pick and choose different types of technologies that are, that, are, that are better suited for different environments. So if I'm in, a, if I'm, if I'm in an urban area where there's really high population density, um, uh, something like fiber, you know, fiber connectivity is really king. And, um, and the cost economics of that will, will work better in a place where there's a lot of density. Uh, and also customers who can afford to spend more on connectivity as well. As I, as I go into places that are lower population density, as I leave the cities and go into rural areas, then things like fiber become more and more difficult for me to deploy all the way to the customer. I may be able to bring a, a high capacity link to that, that village, but once I get to that village uh, or, or the surrounding areas, I'm going to want to use uh, you know, uh, other technologies. And this is where terrestrial wireless technologies come into play. So I talked about you know, 5 gigahertz earlier. That's sort of higher up in the bands. That's for like shorter range. Uh, so-called line of sight, nothing in the way kind of connectivity. And then as I go down in the frequencies down to TV white spaces, that's great for longer range connectivity, basically a, a wireless connection hanging off of a high capacity fiber, fiber link that might go to a tower. As I get to really rural areas, like I'm talking now like less than 10 people per square mile or even less, even then uh, the fixed wireless technologies stop uh, being as beneficial. Now I'm talking about things like satellite. Um, and we have, there's, a, there's an, a whole emerging uh, um, set of promising technologies uh, coming to market now, um, so-called low Earth orbit satellites that have lower latency and, and higher capacity. And uh, you have major companies um, um, in, the, in the process of spending billions of dollars to launch those systems. So you know, one can see where, where TV white spaces would sort of fit into the continuum of technologies that would be deployed. So I've been at this for, you know, for 20 years myself, um, you know, through, through multiple jobs. And um, the one question that you know, sort of reflecting back on this is, is uh, you know, why, why have why why have none of you heard of TV white spaces? Uh, and um, I mean, we've all heard of TV white spaces because we're we're in the space. But I think I bet many of you in the audience this is the first time hearing about this. And um, you know, why haven't we seen um, uh, more serious I investment uh, in in TV white spaces? And as I thought about it, I thought about the tension that often exists between. Uh, you know how disruptive a new technology is, and how big a market potential it has. And there's there's always this tension with any kind of new technology there. And and I think of TV white spaces as one of those examples where it's very disruptive. It's it's a it's a it's a new kind of way of 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 managing spectrum resources from the regulator's perspective. Um, it's a technology that is is has the potential to be very low cost. Um, it has the potential, therefore, to, to compete with a lot of um, existing technologies that are in the marketplace already. Um, and for the companies themselves, it, it's, it's, a, it's a potential for disruption to themselves. So it's basically sort of taking them away from, from a business that there's, they're making good money off of today into something that is, is maybe a little less certain. And so I think of like TV white spaces as, 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 as having been kind of in the red zone uh, early on. Um, it too disruptive, too different, too weird. Um, and, uh, and just not a clear market opportunity for existing companies. Whereas things like 5G to 6G, you know, that's, those are part of an existing technology ecosystem. It's kind of an evolution of something that already exists, or next generation Wi-Fi is, is much safer, and so you're seeing that come to market faster. Um, so 
in terms of like, you know, specifically what went wrong, you have basically two issues. One was um, the mobile operators, the broadcasters, and the equipment suppliers, like the big you know, companies like ZTE and Huawei and Ericsson and Nokia, that was a real disruption for them, TV white spaces. And so they wanted to basically you know, slow it down and stop it and make it difficult. So you know, they, they um, uh, did all kinds of things to, 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 to make, it, make it difficult, including going to governments and, and trying to get them to adopt very conservative um, uh, um, rules that made it more difficult to commercialize the technology. And then on the other side, you have the Wi-Fi community uh, who initially were the focus of, of, of TV white space technology development. And the bet we made was that, you know, basically TV white spaces would just become another Wi-Fi band and we'd be able to leverage that whole ecosystem. Um, but the challenge there is a Wi-Fi company wants to sell a lot of boxes. You know, that ultimately they want a 500, uh, you know, million unit market at least for themselves. Um, and the thing with TV white space is because the signals travel over a long distance or they penetrate a lot of walls, it means less infrastructure. That's fewer boxes. So that's fewer units for them to sell. So for them, it was also a disruption. Um, and then the other thing with the Wi-Fi communities, they saw that their, that, that their customers, the, the mobile operators, uh, and, and even the, um, the, the equipment manufacturers were having concerns about it, and that scared them as well. And uh, you know, a lot of uncertainty, that, that scared them off. So I, I don't want to be overly neg negative here. So th th I think there's a path forward. And I think we're pretty pretty close to it. And we saw yesterday in a presentation that you know the Gartner curve and sort of like you know where are we? We sort of coming out of the trough. We sort of had you know a lot of early hype. And so I think what what, what what's happening with TV white spaces today is it's sort of being pulled back a bit more into the green area, you know, a little less disruptive, with maybe even an even bigger market potential. Um, and specifically, what I'm talking about is there are there are companies now that have kind of abandoned the whole Wi-Fi path or the proprietary technology path and are developing TV white space technologies based on, on the technologies that all the mobile operators use today and, um, and the suppliers to mobile operators use today. So LTE based, you know, 4G, 5G and potentially 6G um, uh, technologies uh, can leverage that, ecos that scale ecosystem, um, produce really low cost devices that can be particularly helpful to the communities that, that, that could benefit the most from them. And then also what we're seeing is, is regulators um, recognizing that they can, they can be a little less conservative than, than some of the early regulators were with TV white space regulations. Um, and then at least in the early stage of TV white space deployment in their markets, they may not need to have sort of these extra layers of interference protection because there really isn't much going on. If there's just one internet service provider in a rural area using TV white spaces and no one else around, there's really not much of a, you know, a worry about uh, you know, networks interfering with each other. Um, so you might be able to start without, without the, you know, what's called a TV white space database that's there to protect incumbents uh, until there's, there's more use of the frequencies. Um, so with that, um, th those, are, those are my uh, introductory uh, remarks. Here's my contact information and, and I'll transition to Riaz. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much, uh, Paul. So uh, Riaz will pick up on that and will tell us a little bit more from a Microsoft research perspective on how uh, TV white space uh, is being actually also uh, in a way uh, 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 pushed by Microsoft in the context of IoT. Okay, Riaz, go ahead, please. Thank you, Professor Slim and uh, Cost for you know, inviting us here. Uh, it has been really great. Last two days, I've really been enjoying the place. In fact, till two months back, I didn't even know Cost existed, right? So this is really good. And like Paul, he had gray hair. I've got gray beard, thanks to TV White Space. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about, uh, you know, we've, till now we've talked about the uh, licensed bands and fixed wireless, right? Um, and when we've been starting thinking, so let me give a little bit of background about Microsoft Research, right? Our team in Microsoft Research is looking at technology and how technology can help solve, you know, industry problems, industries like agriculture, energy, supply chain, food, and uh, some of this work sort of started in context of agriculture, right? The larger TV white space broadband that Paul just mentioned, right, uh, was has been done at Microsoft for last many years, and we sort of uh, are looking at how we can adopt that for IoT and other use cases. So I'm just going to focus more on the IoT uh, space. Uh, but before we get there, 
we, I wanted to touch on the dynamic uh, spectrum benefits. I know I saw in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Director Saad's uh, presentation that this was one of the future work in the list, right? Um, and so fixed, first let's talk about the challenges with fixed uh, spectrum, right? Uh, one part of the problem is if you've allocated a particular s uh, spectrum to a particular partner or uh, use case, it's fixed. Whether they're using it or not, that band is gone. It's not usable by anyone else during that period. Uh, that given the crunch that already there is limited band, you want to be able to you know, leverage all of that as much as efficiently as possible, right? And which is one of the places where thinking about dynamic spectrum would sort of help. Uh, so what do you mean by dynamic spectrum? That means that you could dynamically sort of know whether a particular spectrum is being used, and if it is not being used, you could leverage it. So it is multiplexed by multiple different uh, user use cases, uh, right? And that sort of gives you better spectrum utilization. That helps with you know relieving some of the crunches. Uh, this also helps with network performance and how does you know given now you have the same band capacity, the spectrum capacity, but you could sort of reuse, which means now you can use the, at least the spectrum that was not being used at that time to, to sort of use it for uh, a real use, right? Uh, the spectrum management is also sort of easier because now you, you're sort of dynamically uh, leveraging, you know, what is unused versus used. Uh, and cost savings, the cost savings comes from the fact that a uh, lo uh, lot of the fixed overhead that sort of managing those spectrums sort of goes away because you are looking at much more dynamic way of sort of allocating and reusing the spectrum, uh, right? And this obviously if you have, goes back to, uh, you know, Director Saad's point of when you're decommissioning, then only when you can reuse this sort of band, right? And if you're innovating and looking at new use cases and solutions, right, you are stuck until that decommission happens. But at least with dynamic, you have an option to sort of uh, start using that band sooner rather than later. So, you know, Paul, a little bit touched that he's been doing 20 years, and, and I should sort of say that, you know, he has been involved, he has been ex-Microsoft, uh, you know, he has been involved with the white space through Microsoft many years, right? Uh, some of the early research that happened in Microsoft uh, goes back to, you know, 2004, which Paul alluded. Uh, we built one of the first TV white space radios to sort of showcase. Uh, he talked about the Kenya use case of, you know, using TV white space network for, uh, for trying out trials where there is a digital divide and, you know, getting some uh, communication access at, uh, in those places. Uh, since I said our team also looks at agriculture and other use cases, we wanted to say, how do we sort of take this TV white space broadband and leverage it to use in what we call the narrow band or the IoT use cases? And that's where some of the research that our team has sort of continued to do, where we built, you know, newer TV white space radios specifically for IoT use cases. Um, so let's talk about, you know, some of these things are obvious. I mean, uh, folks have already talked about it, you know, that the spectrum covering low frequencies, you know, don't require line of sight, you know, you get long distance coverages, uh, especially in the IoT case, right? You do have a large area of IoT deployment, then, you know, fewer boxes, as Paul mentioned, are involved in sort of getting all of the things connected, uh, right? And the other good thing is a lot of the places where there is a need for connectivity, that's where there is more TV, wide, TV channel uh, spectrum available, right? The unused TV channel. So you could use that as to your advantage. However, there are cons, right? There are spatial variations, and some of that was shown in the study that uh, you know, Professor Saleh and Professor Ali talked about right, is that different locations may have different channels used, different uh, um, channels may be available. 
Uh, so there is spatial variation as well as temporal variation. Sometimes you may have a channel which is used for, say, evening, but during the day it is available. And so there is that aspect. Given the fragmented spectrum, right, the, how do you sort of leverage this technology to sort of help solve some of the problems, right? And that's where our goal was to say from Microsoft Research to saying, how can we maximize, how can we use the fact that there is dynamic, uh, dynamic spectrum availability, fact that you could sort of do all of these things uh, to be able to use the band when it is uh, available uh, in the unused space. Spec so the way we sort of think, of, if you think of a TV band channel, it's six megahertz channel, right? And that's basically the band that you, you, that you sort of look at. Uh, so what we started looking at is, can we use sliver of that band? And the reason is, I, for when you look at IoT uh, systems, the amount of data that you need to send is very less, right? The, the users, so in that case, you, could, you don't need that full six megahertz bandwidth. You could le leverage a sliver of that bandwidth to transmit that data. Uh, you could then use that same uh, band, the six megahertz band, to sort of use across connecting multiple different devices because they're all sort of using different, either different bands or sub bands, so slivers, or you could sort of even multiplex on the same, same uh, sliver, right? The other angle to think about it is maybe you need a little bit more bandwidth than one uh, sensor, like we talked about, you know, there's less data, but sometimes, say you want to send a picture, which may require a larger bandwidth, and now you could sort of, instead of using one sliver, you use 10 slivers to sort of send that data in parallel, and so then they use that as a way to get higher throughput and multiplex the same section. So these were all the different things that from research you've been looking at uh, at uh, uh, Microsoft Research. Talking about the TV white space IoT, uh, you know, US has already uh, accepted, and you know, this is a, uh, the regulation, the FCC board has allowed the TV white space IoT use case in the, in the, in the policy, right? So based on the bands and the sliver I was talking about, they've allowed 100 kilohertz per, um, per uh, IoT device. You could have a mobile device, so it means that the, the endpoint could be moving in a geofenced area and you could still use the white space to sort of uh, transmit data. And there is a limit of like 36 seconds per hour of transmission to sort of uh, keep the the power consumption less. Now I know Paul sort of had a much simpler picture of all of the different uh, uh, you know, benefits, but the key part I wanted to drive here was you know, TV white space in general ha you know, uses lower power and uh, longer distance coverage at a lower cost uh, from technology perspective. And, you know, So now I want to touch on, you know, the applications. Like we know that TV white space sort of propagates for longer region, longer distance, right? So the areas where you would need such distance communication, right? Agriculture, where you know you have large farms, you have lots of different sensors on the farm, or you know other equipment that you want to transmit that data to the base, you could have repeaters and using Wi-Fi and other technology to sort of create that network, but then that makes more complex and more uh, cost as well as you know managing those uh, set of networks. So this sort of provides you a easier way to sort of uh, you know leverage the lar larger distance. Similarly, in the oil and gas, you know, remote location where you want to monitor the rigs, th those are again areas where you could sort of leverage this technology. Uh, or you know environmental sensors, especially if you have like a city where you want to monitor you know these sensors which are again spread across the city, you could use some of these uh, sensors sort of using TV white space to communicate and uh, send data to the central location. Uh, so there are multiple different use cases and scenarios where IoT or machine to machine communication, use cases, well, these are some examples. I'm sure there are a lot more as people sort of think through and say, hey, yeah, given the problem space of 
long distance coverage that TV white space gives, you could sort of leverage to solve this problem. So I just wanted to put this, you know, from Microsoft Azure perspective, if you sort of think of, you know, a full solution, like an edge solution, where you want to get different sources of data using different technology, because not one size fits all, right? You want to get all of the data together on an edge. You process some of it on the edge so that you can intelligently transfer the right data at the right time to the cloud for further processing, right? And there are reasons why you want to sort of put that data in the cloud uh, and process that data. So I just want to sort of put, put this slide together at the, you know, at a high level, the architecture of how you could sort of take communication data, take that data, do edge processing using you know, AI and other ways to sort of ide in intelligently identify what uh, data you want to send first to the cloud. So just uh, as everyone has been saying, right, that the world has gone more digital, you know, few countries have already taken the step to sort of take TV white space and leverage that in their use cases. Uh, I believe opening this policy for more companies and more use cases would help, uh, you know, solve some of the crunch in the spectrum. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Liel. So uh, I guess now we'll take a few minutes to, to put the chairs here uh, on the stage uh, so that we, we, we set up uh, uh, the panel and uh, start taking some questions. Right, yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Yes. So while we are doing that, I just want to give you my uh, perspective. First of all, I would like to thank a lot uh, uh, our uh, distinguished panelists for an excellent overview of this uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, but uh, one interesting uh, thing, um, and I think it was highlighted by Paul and way by the others, many of us in the academia have been involved in this uh, uh, so-called spectrum sharing uh, type of technologies. Uh, we wrote many papers in the light na late 90s, early 2000s. Many of these papers end up being highly cited, getting best paper awards. But uh, uh, the, w the problem was always, you know, this technology, you know, in our jargon, we call that cognitive radio, spectrum sharing, spectrum sensing. All of these technology have never made it to, you know, to the market. And uh, we hope now with the really we are getting into this uh, spectrum crunch problem uh, not only in this band but many other bands and also uh, one of the nice thing here in Saudi Arabia CST has been very open minded at least uh, over the last few years and uh, Saudi Arabia was one of the first country worldwide to enlarge the 6 gigahertz band i don't know if you heard about yeah. that which is for the wi-fi it's one of the very few countries so we hope that Saudi Arabia will join this list of countries that will adopt tv white space to enable and unlock many of the interesting application for uh, you know connecting and connected and smart agriculture type of application and this connects very well with uh, the panel we'll have uh, following this panel after the break the panel of uh, shared by professor boon oi so at cost um, we are having a small pilot project where we would like to adopt a tv tv white space test bed uh, with the perspective to for example connect smart farms Sm uh, smart uh, sorry uh, pa palm tree farms so here in the kingdom, and th those of you who were here yesterday, there was an interesting panel on, on dates. Today, uh, uh, we have another interesting panel on uh, technology helping uh, uh, palm tree uh, uh, kind of farming and industry. We believe that if you want this uh, palm tree farm to be uh, fully connected over uh, tens of kilometers, TV white space can be a great uh, option, given the fact that TV white space allow to go through non-line of sight, obstructed type environment, which typically the environment you'll see in this kind of uh, uh, palm tree farms. So with that, I would like to invite the panelists to the, to the stage, and uh, I would like to open, uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, I would like to open the, uh, the session for questions from the audience. I have a question myself, but uh, let's start first from the audience, if you have questions, please. Do you have a mic? Okay, any question from the audience on the study or on TV white space? Okay, I can start. Uh, oh, you have a question? Yeah. I have <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. <laughs> go ahead, please. I have a question to Riyal. Okay, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, now, uh, you know the IAC as a network has use cases. Also, the, the, five, the private 5G. 
Do you think that when the private 5G comes, it should take over the IoT networks as a whole, or it's different use cases? It is different use cases. Right, which is where if you saw the last slide, there was TU white space yeah. and 5G were inside, right? Because so there might be use cases, especially where you want to send a lot of data that might be more beneficial to use 5G because you've got a, a you know, a larger bandwidth to quickly send that data as opposed to T white space where you may sort of, uh, you may be limited because, to send the data. Uh, because you know 5G private networks has a large bandwidth. Yes. So that you can get use of uh, some of the bandwidth that's used in, in 5G networks and use it in the IoT. That's what I'm thinking. I think uh, IoT right. eventually it will uh, collapse because there is much bandwidth in 5G networks. So that's true, but the distance that you have that you could get in that coverage will be much less than what you would get for a, you know, IoT. So, so if your sensors are too far, then you may not get with 5G, which you will get with uh, TV white space. So yeah, so TV white space, one of the measures, I think, uh, I think it has been highlighted, one of the major advantage is uh, favorable channel conditions that allow you to propagate over long distance, over distance where we may have some obstacles, and affordability. The cost is very low. And that's actually why it has been kind of blocked in many ways, right? So it is, in a way, the cheapest technology that can allow to cover over a relatively wide distance. And uh, I mean, at the end of the day, there is no solution that is yeah. going to solve all the problems. It's uh, or one, no, there is one not a size one fits all, but it can be one big part of the IoT uh, as well as unconnected, unconnected type of paradigm. Yeah, I think the other thing to yes. add, the other thing to add on IoT is is it's. There's a lot of use cases in IoT. Some are narrow band, some mm -hmm. are wide band. Um, so if, if you're talking about private LTE networks, certainly for if it's a wide band IoT application like CCTV cameras, where you have to push a lot of data and and have you know a, a, a nice broadband connection, certainly a private LTE network is suitable for that. For what for what Riaz was talking about, we're talking about really narrow band IoT using something called LoRaWAN, um, very low, very long distances, very low power. Um, private LTE probably isn't, isn't the right thing for those kinds of use cases. So it really depends on what you're trying to do from an IoT perspective. Yeah, drone would be a good example because drone generates like 30 GBs of data in like s uh, 30 minutes, right? Now, how do you transfer that much data from the drone to the edge, which is where... The back hole, yeah, probably. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, good, uh, good morning. Uh, nice uh, debate and uh, Ma Maybe speech. you can introduce yourself and your application. Yeah. This I, I know you, but I think <laughs> we're just for the audience. Okay. Dr. Abdullah Maed from King Khalid University in Abha. Uh, my major is electrical engineering and semiconductor fabrication. I have and the graduate from KAUST, right? Yes, I yeah. got my PhD <laughs> from KAUST, and Professor Salem was one of the examiners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, my question about the 5G network, what we know the millimeter wave, which is 30 gigahertz, or the medium 5G, which is 2.4, the attenuation rate is very high. Does the existing towers is uh, supportive to this uh, frequency, or we need to exchange all the existing uh, station to the tiny transmitters for this uh, 5G network? Well, I, could, I can start. I mean, I think, I think overall 5G and 5G use cases and the frequencies used for 5G do require the densification of, of, uh, of wireless networks, whether that's in a mobile mode or a fixed mode. So when you're talking about millimeter wave, you know, as we know, millimeter wave, incredibly wide uh, channels, uh, uh, massive amounts of bandwidth, very low latency, but, but a millimeter wave signal doesn't do well in, in, in uh, on, you know, longer distances. And, through through uh, obstacles or even when it rains or is foggy, so so you have to have uh, yeah, and then you have to have um, backhaul to be able to handle all of that capacity. So so you know fiber deeper into networks and then more more towers or more access points for uh, for that signal to prop to be propagated. So um, so yeah, I mean you do need more infrastructure to to enable the five G use cases. Any extra question from the audience? I have a question actually for Professor Saleh and uh, Professor Ali. So I, I think I, thanks again for the excellent summary of the study so far. So first of all, maybe Professor Saleh uh, as the main PI and the head of the team, 
Can you tell us the value of this collaboration between three of the main universities in the kingdom on this project? And then maybe uh, you and uh, Dr. Ali can comment on the next steps. I think uh, emphasize what still needs to be done so that we can complete our study and deliver to CST a report that hopefully is going to be useful for the next steps. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. In fact, as you know, the collaboration in general is very fundamental for the success of research and developments. And the collaboration as always brings strength. And uh, in this actually type of uh, projects where the three universities are working to together, uh, there is an, uh, a great opportunity that we exchange information between us because there are different experts from different places, different backgrounds, and we learn from each other a lot. And also our com communication and being uh, uh, mandated by CST, the discussion that we had taken with the CST also, this is a give also another extra dimension of information. Of course, this type of projects has enforced us to share the resources. So some of the resources that at KSU are being used by COWS and also KFUBM and vice versa. So sharing the information and resources is a very fundamental and useful in this type of collaboration. I would also mention something uh, related to this. Uh, as I mentioned, we, the three universities, this is not the first time we collaborate. Actually, our collaboration uh, with KFUPM and uh, KAUST uh, with KSU is, goes more than 10 years ago. When uh, uh, CST requested that we do this type of a study, uh, at that time, actually, there is certain results needs to be done in a very short time. And this given the task to the uni three universities. Because we had this type of collaboration long time ago, so we, need, uh, we know each other, so we adapted very quickly. So adaptation is very important. We know each other, we did the results and produced the result in a, a very short time, and we submitted the result CST, which is needed in cer certain days of their conferences. So previous collaboration is also helped in the adaptation and thus people, they know each other. This is very, uh, in fact, very important in, in dealing with the type of these type of collaborations. Uh, as I mentioned, the collaborations bring strength, exchange of knowledge, resources, and these types of things are very important for the success of research and developments in the country and developing the use of capabilities. I will leave the, uh, the, the opportunity for Dr. Ali maybe comments on, on, on this. On, the, on this and also on the next steps. No. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, we are especially located in uh, across the kingdom. So we have the East Coast, we have the middle of the kingdom and the West, and uh, for communication, uh, this is a very good opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, the kingdom has special weather, special conditions, we have dust storms, we have humidity, and having, for example, uh, transceivers at these locations will allow us to, to do channel modeling, work together. Uh, so there is an opportunity. There is also different points of strength. For example, we have a very well-established system of undergraduate students at, at King Saud and King Fahd University. And also we have uh, excellent graduate systems here at Kaos and uh, the other two universities. So I think working together is, is, is natural. And uh, the good thing is that working, working for the kingdom, helping the environment, uh, helping the community around us, contributing to, to, to the kingdom is, is very important. Uh, as of what comes next, I can think of uh, going to the experimental part. So we have done the simulation together uh, with um, uh, excellent resources that CST has. We have cars and uh, well equipped for uh, equipment to measurement to do measurements. Uh, we also can see uh, that we can cooperate with the meteorology. Uh, yesterday there was a presentation by Dr. Ayman regarding their ability to, to take measurements. Uh, ducting, ducting effects where, where, uh, where wireless signals propagate more than what they are supposed to do or less than what they're supposed to do is one, one example. So collaborating between us together maybe with, with, with the meteorology, we can get data about the upper layers of uh, the humidity and, and the temperature and know exactly where ducting effect occurs. Uh, so for example, in, in the East Coast, it's considered one of the uh, most difficult, or I don't want to use worst uh, communication uh, channels. During maybe the, war, uh, the Gulf War, it was very clear that you transmit a signal, your radar is supposed to cover, let's say 50 kilometers, you get the signals out of 300 kilometers, or vice versa. So uh, the only way to, to, to get the data and study is, is to rely on the local universities, local resources that you have, because you are there 24 hours and you are, you are there 12 months a year, so you can collect more and, uh, of, of this data. 
So this is one scenario. I'm also thankful to uh, Professor uh, Mohammed for and Professor Sarah for pushing for these cooperations and uh, under the umbrella of CST. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We still have a few minutes, unless there's a question from the audience. Oh, we do have. Uh, Rawan, go ahead. Introduce yourself. Yeah. So, um, Rawan Al Ghamdi, I'm a PhD student here at CAUS. Um, so, my question is for any of the panelists, really. So, the recent pandemic like highlighted the cost of the digital divide, and that's wh why we are um, advocating more than ever for the digital inclusion, right? So, TV white space is, is one solution, but we like the, the sub 700 um, megahertz because uh, the favorable propagation channel, right? But then it also doesn't have that much capacity. So does that mean that we are moving those who are unconnected to the underconnected category, but that doesn't really solve the problem? Because if we're talking about online education, which um, Dr. Ali mentioned, um, it's like online video streaming and so on that ne needs uh, high capacity, which I, I think might not be um, doable. Maybe for an IoT uh, application, it's it's good, but for high capacities, the 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 population in these um, rural areas will still be underconnected, right? No, that's a very good question. I think Paul, you addressed this question uh, yeah, in one of your slides. I can pick up on that, but yeah, you know, it's, um, it's very much related to. So question. I think there 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 are sort of a couple of dimensions to that. Um, so I, I think. It's true, you have to sort of mix and match te technologies. What works best in some one location may not work best in another location. Um, so TV white space for broadband certainly is something that you would, you would primarily be deploying in areas where there's lower population density, and therefore fewer people um, taxing the resource. Um, so you have fewer people to share the, the available uh, radio frequencies with. Um, and as Riaz pointed out, in rural areas, there's a lot more TV white spaces actually than there are, there are in, in urban areas because there's fewer broadcast signals. To protect, um, so you can deliver you can deliver good you know high speed broadband connectivity over TV white spaces in rural areas, and, and we've seen that. I've done many projects uh, around the world um, doing that. Um, and then I think the other thing is that um, one of the advantages of fixed wireless networks is they can be deployed quickly. And um, one of the things that the COVID uh, you know uh, pandemic showed is the is the urgency of getting people connected. And so even if your plan is in the future, let's say 10 years from now, to have fiber into every village in your country and everybody in a village to have fiber connectivity, what are you going to do between now and then, right? And with a fixed wireless network, you can deploy, deploy that in a matter of months, not a matter of years or decades. So, so I think, it, you know, so I think it's, it is a good, a good opportunity, TV white spaces, for broadband connectivity, especially in low population density areas. And it's also a good step in the direction of getting everybody, um, you know, to have fiber connections in the future. So yeah, so it's, it can be just a transition period, and then when you when you go to a situation where basically you have enough population, enough demand, then become anyway uh, from business perspective economically viable to go for more uh, kind of type of other deployment. And uh, on the other hand, people who are active in TV white space technology now are trying to improve the spectral efficiency. Professor Mohammed Sierra, those who can tell you more about this. So people are going to instead of going for standard constellation, going for high. 256 quam, mm -hmm. so they can basically capitalize on spectral efficiency or some of the modulation to increase the data rate within this, of course, limited spectrum that is available. Let me conclude with uh, maybe hopefully a positive note, and this is addressed to Paul and Riav, uh, uh, you know, hopefully to give us uh, this uh, uh, essentially extra motivation to deploy white space in Saudi Arabia. Based on your 20 years of experience of, uh, you know, um, uh, developing and eventually deploying the white space uh, in the U.S. and worldwide, can you tell us two nice stories about uh, how uh, connectivity have uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, unlocked some uh, uh, areas or some uh, uh, regions uh, uh, from, uh, you know, f using TV white space let's say, technology? Uh, I can give you the example of um, of Kenya, which was the first place um, where we deployed. Uh, TV white spaces in a proper kind of commercial pilot environment. Um, in that case, we went to an area that was rural. Um, in Africa, you have 600 million people who don't have electricity where they live. So this is an area also where people didn't have electricity at home. And uh, we were able to use TV white spaces uh, with permission from the regulator to, um, to uh, deploy um, uh, an entirely solar powered network uh, over TV white spaces. T TV white spaces doesn't use a lot of power, so it's, it's, it's something that is possible because of that. And, um, and we were able to, to bring connectivity to um, uh, schools, healthcare clinics, community centers, 
uh, small businesses and, and residential uh, customers who, who really never had any, any kind of uh, access to the internet before. And, um, and it really, it has real impact. I think a lot of times when you, you know, we're in these kind of settings and we're kind of distant from the impact that we have. I was, a, I was a regulator once myself and you make these, you speak decisions, but you're not really sort of right there where the impact is happening. When you get to see what this does for people in their lives and, and helps them get better educated and access to healthcare, it makes a huge difference. So, so I think um, I've seen it firsthand and, and in many places, Kenya is just one example. Thank you. Do you have any, any kind of example in the IoT or smart agriculture, let's say, type sure, of uh, definite, area? Sure, definitely. Uh, so we've been working with a farmer in eastern Washington. He's a fifth generation farmer. Uh, he's also, by education, a computer science uh, background. He's got 8,000 acres of wheat farm in eastern Washington. And what he has been able to do working with us is he's got 25 locations where he's put sensors on his uh, farms and that uh, those sensors are sort of u sending data using TU White Space IoT to his center, you know, gateway and from there to his house and then to the cloud. And that's how he's been able to sort of see some of the impact that is having, I mean, the sensor information from the farm. So one of the things that he sort of uses this is for sensing the temperature, you know, weather. So when, when you get a weather forecast, you get a weather forecast for an area not a particular point within that area. And there are a lot of microclimates that exist within the area. So what we've been able to do with him was take some of that historical sensor information, take historical weather forecast, and train our AI model to sort of figure out what would be the microclimate prediction at that point within the farm, right? And so this is where you know, we were able to sort of use some of these use cases to help solve some of the real problem for him. Because now he can sort of know, oh, tomorrow, this is gonna be my forecast wind speed at the farm and whether I should pour, spray pesticides or fertilizer in the morning or in the afternoon, depending on you know, the conditions or even what operations I should do next day on the farm based on the temperature at the farm. So some of these things sort of helps him make better decisions based on the data that he can now see from the farm. Thank you very much. We are right on time. Uh, let's uh, please thank uh, all our distinguished speakers and uh, thank you also for attending. And